Welcome once again. Great to see so many of you here today. Breaking news. In the last few weeks, it has been wonderful to see a renewed interest in firming up holidays and new bookings coming in. The good news is there are countries that have already opened their borders and are welcoming vaccinated visitors. And more countries are joining in. While we may not be able to take up their offer and travel until the 17th of May, but with our vaccination program proceeding as per schedule, we have the opportunity to be among the first ones to visit those countries before mass tourism begins there. So for all of us smitten and bitten by the travel bug, there is hope in the second half of the year. Today, we will be exploring the Hindu Kush region and the high Pamirs. Tajikistan or Tajikistan, as they call it, landlocked and it is the smallest country with the highest mountains in Central Asia or rather amongst the five stands of Central Asia. Like the other stands, this too was part of the Soviet Union from 1929 until it gained independence in 1991. Tajikistan is not just about dramatic highlands and imposing glaciers. They have their share of beautiful fortresses and mausoleums with amazing tile work, which is so characteristic of Central Asia. Inhabited for over 4,000 years, it was part of the ancient Silk Road. Modern day Tajikistan reflects this blend of cultures. Venture into the lush Wakhan Valley and take in the rural lifestyle of the Waki herdsmen with their picturesque villages. And you will know why Tajikistan is the quintessential travel the unknown destination. All those of you who have attended our Uzbekistan and Georgia events would already be familiar with our speaker today. Sophie Ibbotson has been involved with the development of tourism in Central Asian countries like Uzbekistan and Tajikistan since 2008. She is the author of Tajikistan Rat Travel Guide. Sophie is also a consultant to the World Bank and Tajikistan State Committee for Tourism De Development, supporting the Rural Economic Development Project in the Khatlon and Gorno Badakhshan Autonomous Regions. Post Sophie's presentation and before the question answers, I shall give you a quick overview of our tours. May we request you to please send any questions either only during the question answer round or as a direct message to me. There is an option in the chat box to send direct or private messages and then I can take them up during the question answer round with Sophie. Thank you. Thank you. I want to turn the spotlight on Sophie. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much, Sunita, and thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, I think this is probably the biggest audience I've ever had for a talk about Tajikistan. Um, normally when I, I give a talk, obviously it's, it's in person, and because it's, it's a relatively small, relatively unknown, and some might say quite obscure destination, uh, getting 30 or 40 people to, to turn up is, I consider, job well done. Um, according to Zoom at the moment, there are currently 258 of you on the call. So this is uh, absolutely fantastic. And I hope that you'll not only learn a little bit about the roof of the world and uh, one of the most exciting destinations in Central Asia, but also that you will think seriously about travelling to Tajikistan either later this year or in the future with Travel the Unknown. My talk today, providing I can get my slides to work, hurrah, yeah, um, is going to start with a map to give you a little bit of orientation. Um, I'm aware that a lot of people are somewhat hazy on the geography about where Tajikistan sits in the world and even more so about what the country looks like and where different things are. What you can see here um, obviously, we have got Uzbekistan, the heart of the Silk Road to the west of the country, Kyrgyzstan with its very strong nomadic culture and beautiful scenery to the north, China to the east, and then Pakistan and Afghanistan to the south. The southern border here that you can see is the River Panj, and this is the Oxus of antiquity. Um, the Oxus, obviously, visited by Alexander the Great, recorded by Ptolemy, in his geographies and a central location in the great game, the 19th century tournament of shadows between the spies and diplomats of the British Empire and the Russian Empire where they met in Central Asia. That river is a natural border as well as being a physical barrier with the countries to the south. The borders to the north are man-made borders um, and some would say much less natural and they were defined really by the Soviets in the early 20th century and they were defined, in theory at least, on linguistic and ethnic grounds. 
but the Tajiks feel that they got a short deal with this. Um, they lost a lot of territory and indeed there are more Tajik speakers outside of modern Tajikistan than inside the borders of the country. The loss of Samarkand and Bukhara, two predominantly Tajik speaking, Tajik cultured cities, is felt particularly hard. But since 1991, Tajikistan has been going its own way and forging its own identity within Central Asia. There are four main provinces within the country, Sukht in the north, the region of Republican subordination, a little bit of a mouthful there, in the centre of the country, which is the area surrounding the capital Dushanbe, Khatlon in the southwest, and then the east of the country is Gorno Badakhshan, better known as the Pamir, or the roof of the world because of its huge mountains. If you have thought about Tajikistan before, if you can picture it in your mind's eye, the chances are that what you'll see is something like one of these four pictures here. People often think about the landscape and the mountains in particular. They see the wilderness, the sparse human population, and a really dramatic backdrop for all manner of adventures. The scale of the landscape really can't be overestimated. Ismail Somani, which is the tallest peak in, Uzbek uh, sorry, in Tajikistan, rises to a height of almost seven and a half thousand meters, or for those of you who prefer it in feet, that's 24 and a half thousand feet, truly huge. You'll be able to see a lot of these landscapes, these adventures backdrops, when you drive across Tajikistan, um, both along the, the Pamir Highway, which um, crosses much of the eastern part of the country, but also on the routes through the Fan and the Zerifshan mountains in the west. So if you enter from Uzbekistan, for example, on Travel the Unknown's uh, Village Walks itinerary, you will still see some of this impressive mountain scenery. One of the particularly iconic natural locations in Tajikistan is Iskanderkul. And Iskanderkul in, in Persian or Tajik means Alexander's Lake. And legend has it that if you come here on a full moon night, you will see Bukephalus, the horse of Alexander the Great, rising out of the water. Um, I have been here, I have camped on full moon, I haven't yet seen the horse, but that doesn't stop me and plenty of other people looking just in case. Um, he puts in an appearance. The nice thing about Iskanderkul and some of the other lakes in the fan, the, the seven lakes in particular, is that they're relatively accessible and, and you don't have to enjoy them. It's possible to drive to the lakeshore at Iskanderkul and then within about 30 minutes to hike up to a waterfall that is 40 metres tall and known as the Niagara of the Fans. So you can enjoy the scenery, you can enjoy the landscape, and you don't have to go to extremes in order to do so. The main focus of my talk today though is not going to be on the natural wonders of Tajikistan. It's going to be about the historical and cultural sites and there's two reasons that I wanted to do this. First of all, not, all, not all of us have the the fitness or the inclination for extreme adventure, for camping and, and summiting mountains but that doesn't mean that you can't go to Tajikistan and you can't appreciate what the country has to offer. My second reason is that there's really very little awareness of the richness of the culture and the archaeology in Tajikistan. When I talk to people about Central Asia, particularly in the UK, they seem to think that you go to Uzbekistan for culture and you go to Tajikistan for an adventure and that there is a clear divide between the two. But that's simply not true. Uzbekistan has got some fantastic national parks and mountain landscapes and on the converse um, Tajikistan has got some phenomenal archaeological sites in particular, um, wild mountain fortresses, um, restored castles, mausoleums, museums and all sorts of things which culture lovers like myself can really um, enjoy. I am particularly fascinated by the ancient history of Tajikistan and the archaeological sites because they tell us about the great civilizations which inhabited Central Asia two, three thousand years ago or even longer. Um, in the case of Sarazm, which is one of Tajikistan's UNESCO World Heritage Sites, it's a city 5,000 years old. This picture here is from Penjikent, which was in the 5th century a major Sogdian city 
on the Silk Road. The Sogdians were um, incredibly successful traders, incredibly cultured individuals, um, intellectuals, and the archaeological sites, the excavations which are happening at Penjakent are actually being led by the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, the archaeologists from there, because they recognise that it's a site of such historic importance. So what you see here is, is part of the, the Penjkent site that has already been, been dug out from the sand, and you can see it's, it's relatively substantial in size um, and relatively interesting to look at. What is absolutely fantastic, however, is not the buildings which have survived, but what was found inside them. Have a look at this. These are some of the, the frescoes, the murals, the wall paintings which have been excavated from Penge Kent. And in my mind, they rival any from the Roman Empire or ancient Greece. They show that the Sogdians had a cosmopolitan international society. There is a very strong Hellenistic influence in the artistic style, a reminder that Alexander the Great, although he personally didn't spend so long in Central Asia, he left behind um, troops who founded his new Greco-Bactrian dynasties, kingdoms in the region. Um, there was trade with, with Greece as well, and so the cultural influence are surviving even several hundred years after Alexander had died. There is evidence from these paintings of Zoroastrianism, of Buddhism, Christianity, and of Indic sects, including Shaivism, which had travelled here from India. So we realise that Although now Tajikistan might feel like the absolute back of beyond, if we go back 1500 or 2000 years ago, it was incredibly well connected, not only with um, other parts of Central Asia, but also with China, with the Indian subcontinent, Persia, and also with Europe. And this excites me a great deal. So Penjkent is relatively well known internationally. It's on UNESCO's list for tentative status for, um, sorry, the tentative list for World Heritage Site status. And the artefacts excavated there are in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, but also in the local Rodaki Museum in Penjkent and at the State Museum of Antiquities in Dushanbe, Tajikistan's capital. And when you're in D Tajikistan, particularly in Dushanbe, I do recommend you go to that museum because there's some phenomenal artefacts to see. So, it's well known. But what about this? I think this is probably the most spectacular and least well known archaeological site in Central Asia right now. Um, the Telegraph calls it the Machu Picchu of Tajikistan and it's a lost city high in the Pamir Mountains. Most remarkably enough, it was only discovered in 2012 and the archaeologists that have been working there since have been gradually lifting back the layers and finding more and more of the city. The city in question is called Castle Karon, and it's very close to Kala, the modern town of Kalakum, which is right on the Pamir Highway. If you choose to go on Travel the Unknown's Odyssey tour, you'll pass right by this site. Um, and so I'm going to recommend to David and Rahul and Sunita that they add it as a stop because it, it's not currently mentioned on the itinerary but I think because it's it's so new. Um, I actually was only able to go for my go myself for the first time in 2019. I had driven past probably a dozen times over the years in the run-up to that and didn't even know it was there despite the fact that the road is almost in shot on the on the left hand side of this photo. It was this structure which made um, the archaeologists curious and think that it was a site worthy of um, study. The landowner had, whose, whose um, land this is on had called in an archaeologist and basically said, will you come and have a look at it? What do you think it is? Um, and the assumption would have been that it was some kind of medieval shrine or mausoleum of which there are a number dotted across Tajikistan. Well, it's not a mausoleum. And we know that because when the archaeologists started looking at it, that they realised there was no chamber inside for a body. It's been built like a ziggurat um, on a cross-shaped base. And the cross is a sign of a symbol of Zoroastrianism, a symbol for the, for the sun and for the fire. 
And when they started looking more and more, and particularly when they started looking inside it, they realized although there wasn't a body chamber, there was a ritual basin and a water pipe. And this added to the evidence combined with the Zoroastrian features that it was probably a Zoroastrian fire temple. There are similar architectural and archaeological models for this in Iran, but no surviving examples anywhere else in Central Asia. So this is completely unique and much, much older than they thought it might be. The question was then, what was it doing here? Why would you build a fire temple in the absolute middle of nowhere? Well, it wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It appeared to be in the middle of nowhere, but as the archaeologists started surveying the site, they found more and more and more. The gentleman in the, the bottom left is the chief archaeologist for the site, Mr Yakubov, and he has so far identified the site covering at least 100 hectares, and the oldest part of it dates back to the second millennium BC. They've excavated the citadel, part of which is in the two photos on the right, a customs post, metals workshops, gold mines, a water temple, and some kind of astronomical observatory. One of the coolest things, as far as I'm concerned, is there was also a polo stadium here, which measured 300 metres long by 50 metres wide. And they estimate that in the stadium, there would have been space for about 10,000 spectators, uh, both men and women which is more than six times the population of the modern town of Kalakum today. I, the mind boggles to think where all these people must have come from, but it suggests that um, at its height, Castle Koron must have had a substantial population and people would have traveled from all around to come specifically to watch the polo. The archeologists are working there in the spring, uh, late spring and summer months. And so if you do come to Tajikistan at that time of year, and visit Karon, the chances are that you'll meet them and see them at work. Um, it's still very unknown as a tourist site, so you'll probably have the site to yourself. The, the third archaeological um, area of uh, attractions that I'd like to mention is, is the Wakan Corridor, um, which is also included in Tajik, um, Travel the Unknown's Odyssey itinerary. And this is the valley between Afghanistan to the south, Tajikistan to the north. And it's the dividing line between two mountain ranges, the Pamir and the Hindu Kush. Historically, this was the route to India because it was a natural pass through the mountains. And it's thought that when um, Marco Polo made his journey east to China, that he came through the Wakan Corridor. Now, as the um, main route through the mountains, it was a place of great strategic importance. You wanted people to be able to travel through, but you also wanted the goods to be able to travel through. And you wanted to make sure, if you were the local ruler, that you could stop them and charge them uh, the appropriate amount of tax on their way through. So the rulers and multiple periods of history built very large numbers of fortresses all along the corridor, of which probably about a dozen survive. The two which you can see here are Yamchun on the left, and at the bottom, Kahaha, which is uh, quite close to, um, is in the village of Namangut, um, not too far away from Yamchun. Um, the same area also has very large collections of petroglyphs, holy hot springs, and also the Buddhist stupa at Rang, because this is the route by which Buddhism too traveled from South Asia into Central Asia. The sites I've shown you so far have a, a noticeable absence of people and are quite disconnected from modern Tajikistan. I want to reassure you, however, that you will meet people wherever you go in Tajikistan and you'll have the opportunity to experience very warm Tajik hospitality. Korog, which is pictured here, is probably one of my favourite cities in all of Central Asia and it's a very cosmopolitan place actually which often surprises people and there's several reasons for that. One is um, that it has a campus at the University of Central Asia which is funded by the Alpha Khan and has international students from neighbouring countries as well as from Tajikistan but it's also a bit of a backpacker town um, particularly in the summer months. It's got a very laid-back feel a bit like a, a Dharmashala or a Shimla in India um, so there are lots of people who come here 
and stop in Horog for a week or two, perhaps if they're cycling or driving the Pamir Highway or if they're hiking, they want to have some downtime, relax, eat some good food and enjoy themselves. And they do that in Horog. It's a small city. Um, I think the population is about 30,000 people, very walkable and very green. Um, there's a botanical garden, which is thought to be one of the highest in the world. And it's a good place to see um, indigenous plants, which you may not be able to see elsewhere. Importantly for me um, and possibly for you as well, it also has the best Indian restaurant anywhere in Central Asia. Um, which is called Delhi Darbar, and it has a bit of a, a cult following amongst expats and travellers alike. I'm going to end the, the virtual tour and talk in Dushanbe, which is the capital and most populous city of Tajikistan. The skyline is changing very rapidly as Dushanbe grows, and a lot of the Soviet architecture is being replaced with modern buildings and part of it is a, a bid to define Tajikistan's modern identity, um, to move away from its, its Soviet years and to, to strike a new path. There's really now quite an eclectic mix of architectural styles within the city. Um, some of the buildings you have here, um, you have the Ismaili Centre at the top left, which is the um, religious and cultural centre of the Ismaili community, followers of the Aga Khan. The top right is the what used to be the main mosque in uh, Dushanbe, although a new, a new larger mosque ha has now been constructed. The bottom left is the children's puppet theatre, built in the Soviet period, the entire facade of which is covered with mosaics. And in the bottom right is the Nauru's Palace, um, which was built just a few years ago. They thought it was going to be the world's biggest tea house, but then realised it was far too over the top for that. So now it's an event space. Um, where it is, or there are conferences and other international events. The Soviet buildings in Tajikistan are going out of fashion, which I find quite sad because although it may not be a part of um, Tajikistan's history that the country is particularly proud of, particularly compared to the ancient history of which um, there is so much um, richness, actually the Soviet Union did do um, a lot for Tajikistan and it, it transformed large parts of, of the country. And the heritage of those buildings, whether it's the university or uh, the opera and ballet theatre, the Russian drama theatre, um, it, it's an important part of the city's history. And I do recommend when you're in the city, taking time to, to walk around to see some of those buildings inside and out. And of course, if you do get the opportunity to go to a, a performance at the opera and ballet, um, that's a particularly way to enjoy, particularly good way to enjoy the space. There are a lot of parks and gardens in Dushanbe too, and in the summer months when the city can be quite hot, um, they're a lovely place to to cool down and relax. And I do find that if you take a walk in the gardens, if you stop for a picnic or a coffee, um, lots of people will come up to you, particularly young people who want to practice their English, and it's a really great way to meet local people to chat to them, to ask your questions about the country and to find out their view about what Tajikistan is like today and where the country is going. I'm going to finish on that note because I think there'll probably be quite a lot of questions and I'd, I'd love to sort of find out what you want to know and, and hopefully give you some very relevant answers. Um, but my, my main point is Tajikistan is best seen, it is best experienced and it is best explored. Um, you do need to go with the right tour operator. It is not the easiest country to travel around in because of the, the physical geography and the logistics, but Travel the Unknown have got a lot of experience there now and I would certainly feel very comfortable travelling with them and I know if you do you'll have an absolutely fantastic time. Thank you so much Sophie, that was such an amazing tour and wish there was like a Star Trek kind of an option where we could just be beamed into anywhere in Tajikistan and especially the ruins. I think personally, I would have loved to go there. <laughs> well, maybe someday. And uh, so I think before we go on to the question answer round, we'll, um, I'll just quickly take everyone through our tours. So I'll have to bring up my screen. Bear with me a moment, please. So talking about our tours, let's start with the standalone tour of Tajikistan. 
uh, the, uh, the Tagi, sorry, <laughs> that's quite a tongue twister. <laughs> Tajikistan Odyssey, which is a 13 day trip. It starts in Dushanbe, which is in the Western part. And then you move on East, visiting some of the very interesting places that Sophie mentioned, uh, going right up to the East and then go Northwards. This tour ends in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. The reason being that if you come back to Dushanbe, you would be practically, uh, you know, retracing your steps and coming back on the same route. And there's so much of uh, amazing scenery to be explored. So it makes sense to go into Kyrgyzstan and end there and take in everything that you get to see there. We do run it as a group trip and once a year uh, during the springtime, uh, May time, which is uh, one of the best times to be there, or it can be taken as a private trip any uh, time of the year. Um, best months are again between May to September. Uh, we do have a date here for 2022. For 2021, while there is a date for May, but then uh, one is we are awaiting the reopening of the borders, uh, the Kyrgyzstan borders. And um, also UK clients may not be able to travel then. So we will be adding a date sometime towards August or September. Do uh, look at our website or contact us for more details. Uh, as to when uh, we put the tour and for all those interested in the group trip. Then we have a multi-country tour, the Five Star Odyssey trip, which takes in all the five stars. So Tajikistan is part of that. And that doesn't, that's not such an in-depth tour of Tajikistan that just takes you mainly to the Western part and you get to see the highlights there. Again, we run these trips in uh, during April as well as August. And um, one of our most popular trips, though it's 30 days, but it is one of the most popular tours because for somebody who's traveling all the way there to Central Asia, they want to get a feel of all the countries and visit it all in one shot. Um, we have guaranteed departures uh, right from 27th August because we do have the required numbers on this tour right up to 30th of August next year. All these tours have bookings on them. The four stand or the, um, the journey through the four stands. This is a tour which takes in four of the stands, excluding Uzbekistan. Generally, that's one of the countries which uh, is something that people want to explore as a standalone destination. They want to go there and spend a lot more time. So it's for those who have visited and then Uzbekistan and then want to visit the rest of the stands. Here again, we run trips, group trips during April and September. And this can also be done as a private trip anytime during those months. Uh, this is the recommended uh, private trip, which Sophie was talking about, the village walks in Tajikistan. Um, you get to visit, you get to see some of the most stunning scenery and uh, get to meet the locals there. And it can be very well combined with a tour of um, Uzbekistan, or even if you want to do, because it's in the western part of the country, it's easily combinable with Uzbekistan. So you can do a tour and then add this as an extension, or if you want to kind of do a little bit of Western Tajikistan and then add this as an extension, alternatively, even from Kyrgyzstan, it might be a slightly longer way of getting into the country and doing it, but it's not impossible. So this is offered as a private trip because mainly it is to add it as an extension to any trip or we can organize this as a private tour, uh, as an extended version of a private tour and add more days. Tajikistan is five hours ahead of uh, GMT and uh, there are no direct flights into the country. So you fly either via Turkey or the Middle East. Um, an e-visa has to be completed before you travel. Their currency is called Somoni and it's largely a cash only economy. Um, very few ATMs in Dushanbe and credit cards are also not widely accepted. So it's uh, better to carry some currency which can be exchanged easily. Best time to travel is between May to September. So now let's go on to the question answer round. So Sophie, please, could you join us? And I have some questions here. So we start. you did mention about the Soviet buildings um, being done away with. So what are the relations that they have with Russia as of now? Generally, the relationship is reasonably good. Um, there are very pragmatic reasons for that. Russia is still a major investor in Tajikistan. Um, it's still an important political and diplomatic partner, but also huge numbers of Tajiks are migrant workers in Russia. Um, in some years, the um, remittances from workers in, in Russia can be sort of between 25 and 40 percent of total GDP. So there is a vast economic dependency on Russia and that means that 
political relations have to be kept quite sweet because Tajikistan's economy depends on what is happening there. Great, thank you. If you speak Russian, you'll also find that a lot of uh, people within Tajikistan speak Russian too. Uh, so there are, there are cultural links as well. True, isn't it? In most of those countries, they call it the language of international communication. Yes. It's <laughs> all can speak Russian. Lingua franca. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it possible to cross the border um, from the Wakhan corridor into Afghanistan? Yes. Um, and if you are wanting to go to Afghanistan, that is currently the best and safest way to do it. Um, I have been to the Afghan Wakhan via Tajikistan three times now, and I'm hoping to do it later again this year. Uh, the border is open at Ishkashim, um, which is a, a border town on the river. Um, and from there, you can go east into, to, uh, into the Wakhan corridor. And it's much better than flying to Kabul and then trying to go across country within Afghanistan, which isn't safe. Thank you. Are there any caves to explore? There are some caves. Um, I haven't uh, explored them myself. I'm actually quite claustrophobic, so I don't, I don't do caving. Uh, but I understand there are a lot if you are into caving and potholing. And in the southwest of Tajikistan in Khatlon, there are also some um, cave churches which were inhabited uh, in the early centuries AD by the Nestorian Christians. Um, and those have survived. They're not in terribly good condition. It's not like going to the cave churches in, in Georgia or in uh, Turkey, but they are there. Um, I know a good local guide will be able to take you, so you'll be able to see the, sort of the cultural and historic angle of the caves as well as the, the physical geography. Wonderful, that sounds interesting. Thank you. And uh, the best time to visit, like we said, between May to September, but when would you say is really ideal? I mean, is it one of those countries where summer should be avoided or is it okay to travel? It depends where you want to go. If you want to go into the high Pamir, the height of summer is absolutely fine. Um, if you want to go into the lower lands, uh, lower parts of Tajikistan, so the western part of the country, I would say spring and autumn is, is better there because it can be 45 degrees in, in summer and very, very hot. But for the Pamir, uh, high summer is best and if anything slightly later so maybe June July through to September October because in in May in the first part of June the rivers will still be in spates with the, the melting snow and the glacial meltwater and that can take out the road um, and make traveling a little challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Great thanks. Um, are there any opportunities for anyone to study Persian take up a Persian course there? There are, um, just so people are aware. So the Tajik language, um, although we talk about it as Tajik, is actually mutually intelligible with Persian and some would argue it is one and the same language. Uh, it's written in a different alphabet because of the, the Soviet history of Tajikistan. So Tajik is written in Cyrillic script rather than in Perso-Arabic. Um, but if you have somebody from Tehran visiting Dushanbe, uh, they would be able to have a, a very easy conversation with anybody on the street. Um, so there are opportunities for studying language there, but you would probably be doing Tajik in Cyrillic rather than Persian in Perso-Arabic script, which could be a challenge if you then want to, to read and write Persian. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And um, how easy is it to travel solo or independently? And uh, are the locals open to meeting foreigners? Um, it is possible to travel independently and solo, and I have done it. You would be highly advised to have some Russian or some Tajik because outside of the tourist centers, very few people speak any English. Um, and you also need a lot of patience and be prepared to put up with physical challenges because currently there aren't any um, real, I mean, there are occasional domestic flights from Dushanbe to Hujand. Sometimes there are domestic flights to Korog, but 99% of the time you'll be traveling by road. The road conditions are tough. Um, and so if you're going by bus or trying to drive yourself, um, you, you need to be prepared for the journey. Um, if you're in any doubt, it is better to go with a tour operator like Travel the Unknown because they will look after all the logistical and physical challenges for you and um, just generally make sure you have a much more comfortable time. True. I mean, imagine if a car should break down somewhere in the high palm here. <laughs> I, the first time I went to Tajikistan in 2010, 
the river was swollen and taken out part of the road just north of Porog. And we did get stuck in the mud and we had to be dug out by the army who happened to be passing. So <laughs> <laughs> we did return the favour further up the road because they had then blown a tyre and needed sort of a, a push and things. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you were lucky there. <laughs> Very lucky. And what is the food like? Um, the food is very, very mixed. So in the summer you have huge amounts of fruit and vegetables, um, particularly the, the northern part of Tajikistan and the southwest are quite fertile agricultural areas. Um, the Pamir, however, is a high altitude desert, so much, much less grows and the food choices there will be inevitably more limited. Um, you'll find quite a lot of noodles. Obviously, you're next door to China and it's uh, Lugman is a, a Central Asian noodle speciality. Mm -hmm. A lot of kebabs, um, chicken and uh, beef and lamb, um, fresh bread. Every meal comes with fresh bread, which is absolutely delicious because it's, it's always homemade. Um, lots of jam, salads. Uh, if you are vegetarian, things will be a little trickier. Um, it is possible to be a vegetarian in Tajikistan and hotels and restaurants that cater to tourists are becoming more used to it, um, but it is worthwhile telling your tour operator before you travel so that they can make plans accordingly. Make sure that there is there is vegetarian options for you. Thank you. How easy or difficult would you say is the e-visa process? The e-visa actually is pretty straightforward. Um, I think it's about $20 um, and uh, yeah, I, I haven't had any problems with it to be honest. Great, thank you. And uh, it does seem that like, you know, poverty, drugs, uh, corruption, these kind of things, um, you do hear of these kind of things uh, in Tajikistan. How would you assess the current situation and how safe is it for tourists? For tourists, I would say it is, is generally very, very safe. Um, the, the threat to tourists, the sort of genuine threat, the things that the British Embassy has to deal with are maybe road accidents um, or people who've been caught when there's been a some sort of natural disaster occasionally, if there is a, a landslip or a, occasionally a, a road is closed. So those are the sorts of problems which tourists might encounter. Um, you're unlikely to ever see anything to do with the drugs trade because actually addiction in Tajikistan is very low. The opium which is produced in Afghanistan is transited through Tajikistan and is going to Russia and to Europe because they know they make far more money selling it there than to poor communities in, in Tajikistan. Um, so you won't really see anything of, of the drugs trade, although it is flowing through the country. Um, corruption, it is a problem. Um, I would say it is more of a problem for the local population than for the tourists, because the, tu the uh, police and other government officials who are the problem in the, the corruption chain um, are not people you're generally going to be dealing with. Um, most police might stop a, a local car to, to try and get a get a couple of dollars out of them. But if if you're in an organised group uh, with a tour operator, your your driver will know how to handle the situation. And to be honest, the, the policemen aren't going to be able to speak any English, so they're not going to be able to tell you what they want anyway. And sooner or later, they get frustrated. They <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> pretend not to understand what's going on. <laughs> Um, but but as a as a tourist on a on an organised tour, you're unlikely to have have a problem with that. <laughs> That's good to know. Has the Anzob tunnel tunnel been uh, improved? It has. Um, so this tunnel was absolutely notorious, um, and it was to the to the north of, of Dushanbe, and you had to drive through it if you were going to to Penjkent or Kujand. And they'd sort of half built the tunnel. Um, but then opened it without finishing it. So you drove through in the dark, uh, usually with sort of quite a lot of water and there were bits of machinery or a man sort of driving his donkeys through it. Um, <laughs> that could be rather terrifying if, if you were at the wheel and sort of came around a corner and suddenly came face to face with a donkey. Um, it's, it's not up to the standards that you would find driving through the French Alps or through Austria, um, but by regional standards, it's not bad. And they've also finished the, the second tunnel up towards Kujan, which has cut the journey time uh, if you're traveling to the north of Tajikistan. Okay, thank you. 
And there's a TTO question here. How do you get to Tajikistan? You can, from UK, you can fly via uh, Turkish uh, airlines, via Istanbul or via Moscow. Uh, there are indirect options to travel there. I, I recommend the Turkish Airlines flight. They've got the best connections usually. Um, and they've also got a good network across the rest of Central Asia. So if you are, for example, planning on doing a, a twin center trip or a multi-stance tour, you could, for example, fly with Turkish Airlines to um, Bishkek, go overland through Tajikistan and then fly out of Dushanbe with uh, Turkish. Another option which um, has only become viable in the last month or so is to fly direct to Tashkent with Uzbekistan Airlines, which is seven hours straight. Um, and they now twice a week have got a connection from uh, Tashkent to Dushanbe, which obviously is, is just a short hop. Um, and it's been lined up with the London flight. So you can actually connect. I think there's a, maybe a two or three hour layover in Tashkent. But if you do that, that will probably be faster than flying via Istanbul or via Moscow. Thank you. And uh, of course, there's this question about one of our trips again, if it includes Khojand and um, Istarwashan. And uh, yes, it does. Um, going on to the next one. Uh, that's also the answer. That's about Sorry, that was also about any safety issues being close to Afghanistan. So not just not just from the Wakhan corridor area. Are there any safety issues in the other parts of the country, like the western parts, being close um, along the border? Not really. I mean, part of the reason is because you have the river the whole way. There is a physical border. It's like being in a castle with a moat around it. Um, so there there is a physical uh, border separating you from uh, Afghanistan. But also the border is patrolled. Um, it was mined originally by the Soviets and it is patrolled by um, the Tajik border force and the army there. They're keeping an eye on uh, drug smugglers, on um, obviously concern that any militants might come across or any illegal immigrants. So there is there is an army presence uh, periodically um, patrolling the border. But I would say actually very few people come across um, there are a few border crossings, official points, which are, are bridges, but the only one which is regularly open is the uh, border post into the Wakhan and Tishkashin. Most of the places you just can't get across the river. Oh, thank you. And then again, I see another question that is basically to do with the solo female traveller travelling. How is the country? How are they to solo uh, it's, it's fine. I mean, you, you would have to take the, the usual precautions of being a solo female traveller. Um, be aware that Tajikistan is quite a conservative country and local women wouldn't often travel on their own. So you will be a bit of a novelty if you are, if you are traveling um, on your own. But um, I think generally the, the attitude towards uh, female tourists is, is quite respectful. I don't certainly get sort of catcalled or have the hassle that you might have in Egypt or, or in India. Um, culturally that's much less common in, in Tajikistan and indeed across Central Asia. Um, so I think it is, is perfectly possible. Um, I've travelled within Tajikistan with one other female friend um, and with a variety of other small groups of men and female and, and when uh, Inora and I were traveling together, we, we certainly didn't have any problems. Okay. Is there a separate visa required for Gordon production? There isn't a separate visa, but when you do your e-visa application, there is a, a box to tick, which gets you an additional permit for Gordon Badakshan. Um, you can also get that if you change your mind and decide you want to go once you're in Tajikistan. Um, then you have to do this with the physical bureaucracy, but uh, the e-visa with the tick box option for Gabao is, is pretty straightforward. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, could you tell us the name of the city again, which has recently been discovered? That's Castle Caron, K-A-R-O-N. And um, if you look on um, Sunita's map here, where it says Tajikistan, if you go south from the bottom of the J, onto the border. Mm -hmm. um, no, so if, if you if you put your pointer right on the bottom of the J for Tajikistan. Oh, OK. Yeah. 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 And then just go south from there to the border. Mm -hmm. It's basically there. 
Um, well, it's, it's it's just a little bit east of where your your pointer is now, but it's on the Pamir Highway on the Oxus River um, mm -hmm. and just outside the town of Kalaikum. Thank you. Um, one moment, please. In fact, I'm just going through the questions, and uh, there's a lot of uh, you know thanks and appreciation, Sophie, for um, the the presentation and the slides. Um, and then there is something about Turkmenistan as well. So I think I can take that quickly. So you mentioned the archaeological site. And um, <laughs> there are quite a few questions. So sorry. <laughs> sorry, everyone. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kind of scrolling down quickly to just pick up the questions amongst all the messages there. And uh, mainly lots of thanks messages. So. Uh, there's something about trips to Kojan. Yes, we do organize that. And uh, what is the accommodation like? Um, there is a complete mix. So if you are in Dushanbe, you've got your choice of five-star hotels. You've got the Hilton, you've got the Hyatt, you've got the um, Aga Khan Serena Hotel. Um, you've got some local brands. You've got some Soviet era hotels. You've got boutique hotels. You've got hostels. You've got absolutely everything. Uh, once you travel outside of Dushanbe, your options become a little bit more limited. Um, there are some good hotels and um, it helps to know where they are because they're not necessarily in the most expected places. Um, there is one super hotel owned by the Aga Khan in Horok, which is quite small. I think it's about five or six rooms, but that's really good. Um, and if you do want to visit Castle Karan, you'll be really, really, really glad to hear that uh, Kalakum actually has a fantastic hotel, which I never expected because the first time I went there, it was not the most exciting place in the world. Um, and uh, I stayed in a, a pretty dingy guest house, but now it has got a really good hotel, which is owned by the same person who owns the land which Caron was found on. Uh, <laughs> so he's obviously planned, planned accordingly with this. Um, all across the country, you'll find homestays and guest houses and this is something which actually with my my work in Tajikistan I'm really trying to encourage and develop more. Um, the World Bank is is working with a lot of the homestay owners providing them with grants to upgrade their homestays and make sure they've got proper indoor bathrooms, uh, comfortable beds, good linens, all of these kind of things so that they will be, beat, meet um, the standards which Western tourists expect when they come to Tajikistan and I really like these small places. Um, often they've only got three or four rooms, but it's an opportunity to stay with the family, to understand their style of living, um, eat the food that they prepare and see something of real Tajikistan. Um, because yes, it's great staying in, in the Hyatt or the Hilton, but you could be in any city in the world. Whereas if you're staying in a guest house, for example, the, the guest house in Namagut in the um, Wakan Corridor is, is right next to the Kakaha Fortress and the lady there has two rooms in her guest house um, and she has her, her cow and her animals <laughs> and everything that she cooks for you will have been made with vegetables out in the garden. Um, you'll chat to her through her children um, who have been learning English um, and you feel very much a part of the family and that's that's a very special experience. That's true, there's a reflective of the culture and the character of the place and the country. So uh, is altitude an issue in any of those places? Um, it is, um, and that's why it's important to plan your itinerary carefully so that you go up steadily. You won't have a problem with it in the western part of Tajikistan, but if you go up into the high Pamir, and particularly if you drive the Pamir Highway, um, there are some very, very high passes um, and you will quite possibly get um, headaches, uh, trouble sleeping and so on and so forth. I mean, they're the standard things that you might find if you went to Ladakh or Nepal as well. Um, and the important thing is just to pace yourself, um, allow plenty of time um, so that you acclimatize gradually. And then when you're there, not try and rush around. Um, you don't need to speed climb mountains. Um, you can do it more gently than you would on the flat and just understanding your, your own limitations and drink huge amounts of water as well because you do get dehydrated quite easily because of the heat and the altitude and uh, it can be quite easy to forget to drink, particularly for doing a long drive. But uh, I do find that it helps adjust to the altitude as well. Thank you. And how have you tackled the COVID situation there? 
Um, it's really difficult to know. And the reason for that is Tajikistan does not have the healthcare infrastructure to do the testing um, and has not done, therefore hasn't been able to report what the true situation is like. So if you look at the official statistics, the COVID case numbers in Tajikistan have been very, very low. Um, the reality on the ground, uh, when I speak to friends who are living in Tajikistan, all of them know somebody who's had it. Um, lots of them, their, their parents, their aunts and uncles um, ended up in hospital or medication or being cared for at home. So certainly there was a big problem, particularly last summer when all of Central Asia seemed to have a big wave of it. Um, there seems to be less now. Um, I mean, one of the reasons that Tajikistan may have um, coped with it, I would say coped rather than dealt because it wasn't an active um, decision or process that made them do well. Um, but one reason they will have got through it better than some other countries is they have a very, very young population. Um, I think probably about half the population is under 30. Um, so it's the demographic of the country is in their favour. Great. That's good to know too. Are there any nature reserves and what kind of birds or animals are you likely to find? So uh, Tajikistan has got two UNESCO World Heritage Sites. One is the Sarazam archaeological site uh, near to Penj Kent and the other is the Tajik National Park which covers a very large part of the Pamir. Um, and it has UNESCO status because of the importance of its ecosystem, the pristineness of its landscape and the wildlife that lives there. There are also other um, state reserves, uh, for example, around Zorkol in the Wakan Corridor, and the Tigravaya um, Reserve in, in southwest Tajikistan, but the, the Tajik National Park is probably the most important one of these. There are some um, big mammals which you are unlikely to see because they're quite shy but are there. So there are bears, there are wolves, there are Marco Polo sheep, ibex and very very elusive snow leopards. Um, it is my great dream to see a snow leopard in the wild in Tajikistan. Um, they are photographed on the camera traps and Taj Wildlife which is a conservation organisation does great work with the snow leopards um, but I haven't yet been able to see one so hopefully that's something for the future. Um, I know there are a lot of bird species there as well, um, particularly migratory species that come. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not hot on my bird, so I can't tell you particularly which species are there, but um, there, is a, there is a good birding guide to Central Asia, which in, will include all of the species in Tajikistan. That's good to know. At least that also is a possibility for anybody into wildlife and birding, that there is a possibility and that can be added into their itinerary if they travel there. And um, you did mention Aga Khan in between. So what is the connection? Could you please tell us about so the Aga Khan, Khan in Tajikistan? The Aga Khan is um, the leader of the Ishmaeli community, which is a particular Muslim group. And um, so he's, he's sort of the, the Ishmaeli Pope, if you like, but he's also, um, it's a hereditary position. Um, he's a very great philanthropist, uh, a very, very wealthy man. And although he lives, I think, most of his time between London and Switzerland, his businesses and the, the um, income from those businesses is uh, spent wherever there is an Ishmaeli community. So he does a huge amount of work in Afghanistan, Tajikistan, some in Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, and also in parts of Africa, because those are where the Ishmaeli community is concentrated. And in Tajikistan, um, the University of Central Asia, for example, which has got its campus in Korog is uh, Aga, Fun, Aga Khan funded initiative um, and the Ishmaeli community which in Tajikistan is concentrated in the Pamir have a great reverence for the Aga Khan. Um, he hasn't been to Tajikistan for a number of years now, I think he's in his 80s um, so he's, <coughs> he's quite elderly but um, in the same way that if, if the Pope came to visit your, your town uh, everybody would would turn out and have their photos taken and um, really make a big event of it. It is the same feeling about the Aga Khan and I, I have a huge amount of respect for him. Um, he has played a, an important diplomatic role in the region, particularly in Afghanistan. Um, if you look at some of the sort of the photos of the, the Lojigas in, in Kabul, you'll see um, 
from a few years ago, sort of President Karzai sat in the middle and the Aga Khan will be alongside him. Um, there is never a sniff of corruption around his activities, which in the region is almost unheard of. <laughs> and he's also a very successful businessman. I mean, he has um, hotel chains, uh, telecoms companies, racehorses, all sorts of different businesses. And the profits from those all go into his philanthropic activities. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, you did mention the caves to the southwest uh, of the country. Uh, could you give us their name again, please? I, I can't remember what they're called, unfortunately, but if you um, ask the guide about the Nestorian uh, caves, so the oh, Nestorian Christians, um, the, the Nestorian caves are in, in Catalan. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think that's all the questions. And you must take a moment to read all those lovely comments, <laughs> Sophie. And uh, honestly, I mean, I think, yeah, no one better than Sophie to present Tajikistan. <laughs> oh, what <laughs> the Lord. Uh, that's the thing. And I'm so glad everyone uh, enjoyed that. Thank you so much for the lovely compliments. And um, so let's move on to the next slide. Our next two events are as shown here. We will be heading back to the Indian subcontinent. Registration details for the next event and the recording of um, all our previous, previous talks can be found on our events page. And of course, a newsletter will be sent out uh, once the registration link is set up for the next talk. Thank you, Sophie, for whetting our appetite for Tajikistan. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you in two weeks on our virtual tour of Bangladesh. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye.